to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Courtney Nelson, President of City Club. For 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and explore. We're gathered at the Sentinel Hotel today along with all of you listening on OPB radio or viewing on Portland Community Media or YouTube. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media sponsors enables us to put on the, best, the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine, and our current Friday Forum sponsors are Avant Grid Renewables, Airbnb, McKinley Irvin, AARP, and Uber. Please join me in showing our appreciation for our partners. And now on to our program today. The Friday Forum today is titled, From Water Rights to Neighborhood Resilience, Native American Communities at the Forefront of Environmental Justice. North Dakota's Standing Rock Tribe has been leading protests over the Dakota Access Pipeline. The protests have put a bright national spotlight on the powerful role that Native American communities play in environmental justice movements. Today, we will explore how Native communities here in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest are taking the lead on some of the most pressing environmental issues. We're excited for our panel today, and let me introduce them. Kathleen George was recently elected to the Grand Ronde Tribal Council, following five years as the head of the Spirit Mountain Community Fund and 15 years in national resource management for tribal governments. Darrell Kalika is an enrolled citizen of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and has extensive experience in intergovernmental affairs, hydro system planning, and tribal energy policy, serving on the board of directors for the Northwest Energy Coalition. Sean Fleek is a northern Arapaho and works with Opal Environmental Justice to draw attention to the disparities, disparities that historically marginalized communities face in transportation, housing, air quality, and other environmental health concerns. And we are especially honored to have our moderator, Paul Lumley, with us today, as it's his last day as the Executive Director of the Columbia River Intertribal Fisk Fish Commission before he starts as Executive Director of the Native American Youth and Family Center next week. Before we dive into our conversation today, we have a special opening. We're honored to welcome Greg Archuleta of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Rod to start us off with our traditional welcome. Thank you, Greg. Maasi Kanawe Tilikum, Ituktu Karuth, Shlahayam, Naiga Mislai Kabaslus Tom Tom, Naiga Mislai Kabanitsaika Uksan. Ankiri na tilikum sluska mistlike kaba uk ilihi. Naiga sawas ilihi tilikum. Slahayam kaba natsaika tai tilikum. Kaba naiga natsaika chikst. Pi slahayam kanawe tilikum mistlike ikwa uksan. I just wanted to welcome you in our tribal languages. Itukti um, kaduth is the Chinookan language uh, spoken by actually both the Clackamas Chinooks and the Wasco Chinooks Kitched, and also in the Chinook Wawa that we speak today at the Grand Ronde Reservation. And I just wanted to welcome you here today on behalf of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, if you're not familiar with our tribes, that the Chinookan people that lived here in this area, um, in the Portland area, um, were relocated to the Grand Ronde Reservation, including the Willamette Tum Waters of Oregon City area, the Clackamas Chinook, and the Hualalas, or Cascades. And I myself am direct descendants of the couple of the Thais that actually signed the treaties um, and, um, of the Willamette Valley. So I just wanted to welcome you here today, and then I'll, I'll do an opening with one of our prayer songs from our canoe family. Ayumasi. Ho 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 
If you're just joining on OPB, you're listening to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Paul Lumley, and I'm joined by Sean Fleek, Kathleen George, and Darrell Kalika, and we're talking about environmental justice in Native communities. Before we get started, I thought we would take some time to explain a little bit about how tribes view themselves in this place, this earth. Uh, when we as Indian people were placed on earth, we could not survive, and the Creator asked for Volunteers to step forward uh, to help these humans. First came the salmon, followed by the game, and then the roots and the berries. And the creator said that these first foods are sacrifices for you, and if you take care of these foods, they will always take care of you. So oftentimes you'll hear Indian country peoples from all over talk about uh, that relationship that we have with the creator, with our first foods, and I think it's worthwhile to explain this because that will give you a sense of why the tribes and Indian people care so much about our natural resources. It's our future. If we do not uh, take care of these first foods, future generations will have great difficulty. Here in the Portland area, we have about 45,000 Native Americans, and our connection to the environment uh, goes even beyond this area. There are big rivers. We have big fish runs. These fish, this water, comes from many parts of the Pacific Northwest. Even environmental justice concerns are a big interest of ours, not just in this area. We heard a few minutes ago about the Dakota Access Pipeline controversy, another water rights battle. There are many people in the Portland area who care deeply about what's happening so far away. We also have uh, fossil fuel transportation concerns. Uh, with coal and oil coming through this community through the Columbia River Gorge. In fact, early this year we had a, a very terrible and very concerning explosion of an oil train in the city of Mosier. Other areas of concern are Nestle plant being proposed in Cascade Locks, and we've even heard about the Malheur occupation controversy where we had uh, people saying in a very alarming way that this land needs to be returned to its original owners not paying attention that that land was Indian land at one point. So we are Indian people, we are here, we are connected, and we are connected in all ways, not just in the Portland area, but throughout uh, the whole Pacific Northwest region. Now we often talk about the rural and urban divide, but that's not that easy for us as Indian people to define ourselves in that way. In fact, I don't think Native people in the Portland area would even define themselves that way. I'd like to first turn to Kathleen George because Kathleen George was newly elected to the Tribal Council for the Grand Ron, Confederate Tribes of the Grand Ron. 
Uh, Kathleen, the uh, United States has a very unique political relationship with the federal government. That relationship was solidified in our constitution with the United States. It comes in many forms as treaties, as executive orders, and other ways that define our tribal rights and interests. Can you describe the relationship with local, state, and federal governments as it relates to sovereignty, governance, and resource management? Sure, Paul, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, yes, yeah, so our, our tribes, our nine tribes here in the state of Oregon and our tribes throughout this nation, uh, each have a unique and a special government-to-government -government relationship, both with our federal government, and as you outlined very often, the, the formation of that commitment to that special relationship uh, with our federal government is in our constitution and within the many treaties and executive orders that have encoded that over time. And so that means that when tribes need to speak to the federal government, they're doing so and on a government-to-government -government basis. It's not just an interested party, but as tribal governments who reserved not only their own lands to live and support their people, but their rights to their resources off reservation, and sometimes very far off reservation. They never ceded the rights to the waters, the game, the fish, the berries, the roots that continue to be collected uh, to this very day. And so when actions are taken by the federal government that have the potential to harm those resources, to make those resources unhealthy, for tribal people to use, then there is an obligation for the federal government to consult with those tribes on a government-to-government -government basis. And sometimes where we get a few, uh, too far afield from that, and in a recent example of the Dakota Access Pipeline, where those appropriate consultations did not take place in advance of authorizing actions that could severely damage tribal resources or even threaten tribal health. Now, here in the state of Oregon, we also have some very unique relationships with our state government. It is encoded in our own Oregon state government requirements that our state agencies consult regularly and often with our nine tribes of Oregon. And there's a whole structure of different committees uh, through which that takes place. But I feel that uh, what's been done here in the state of Oregon, I hope, will be a spreading model because what we found is that through developing these rich relationships with our co-regulators at the state, we can get ahead of the kind of problems we're seeing on the news now, the Dakota ac uh, pipeline access situation. And that's where we want to be. We want to have those rich, mutually informed relationships where, where possible, we can head off these uh, problems. But also, when we have problems, we can work together to s solve them. And then, of course, on the local basis, where our tribes live and our tribal members are going about their day-to-day -day basis, we have to work with our local counties, we have to work with our local towns on uh, fostering an economy and protection of resources. It's going to work for all of us living together. And so at, at those three scales, we're constantly developing those relationships and trying to remember that an environment that's healthy enough to protect our tribal members and our resources is going to better protect health, livelihood, and safety for all Oregonians. Excellent. Thank you, Kathleen. Darrell, I'd like to uh, turn to you for a moment. Uh, you are the energy policy analyst for the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, which is a very large uh, tribal consortium. I believe there's 54 tribes that are members. And in your work with uh, tribal governments, uh, you often have to try to find ways to uh, protect the environment, thinking about climate change, but also um, uh, energy development and economic development. Uh, can you please share with us some of your uh, interests in that area and perhaps even where tribes have led by example? Thanks, pa can, thanks Paul. So again, like you said, I work with uh, tribes in seven states, an intertribal organization, and we work on the balance between economic development and natural resources. My feeling is that every tribe should have the right, whether they want to or not, develop their energy and economic development resources, tribal economies, and a lot of economic development, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, relies on natural resources, and water being one of the most critical. Um, as Paul mentioned, water is becoming a more and more important resource for all of our communities, especially as more of it becomes in demand by competing interests. And so really wanting to look at how tribes um, can develop their resources. So for many years, the Northwest Hydro System has been built on the backs of tribal resources. But at the same time, 
tribes have been sort of passive participants in the environmental sector, particularly the energy sector. And so the work that I've been able to do is working with tribes who are developing their energy resources. We have the uh, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribe, which just took over the uh, license for Kerr Dam, which was previously a reclamation project. Um, we also have the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs as a co-owner with Pacific, or Portland General Electric on the Pelton Round Butte project. So those are just a couple of examples of how tribes are utilizing their natural resources to develop their own economies, looking at economies of scale. I think going forward, renewable energy is probably going to be a critical piece for tribes, but the other opportunity for tribes is energy efficiency and resource conservation. So I think there are plenty of uh, places that tribes can intersect with the development of uh, their resources and economic development. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Darrell. Um, Sean, I'd like to ask you a few questions, and I, I think you have a fascinating background. You once worked at the Native American Youth Association uh, in the area of development, direct, uh, as a development director or in, in a... No, I was, I was, thanks, Paul. I was um, under the development director under as the a development grants communications director. coordinator. Thank you. And uh, now you're with OPAL, uh, which is Organizing People, Activating Leaders, and uh, you're the Community Engagement Coordinator. So you have this background um, of, of um, fundraising uh, in the Portland area and in the Multnomah County. Uh, there probably are more Native um, Americans live here than any other Indian reservation. So I don't know if people are aware of that, but uh, in your experience, uh, in this area, uh, have tribes been able to participate in various um, nonprofit fundraising the way they should? That's a that's a great question. Um, you, you know, in navigating the sort of contest for resources among urban and uh, rural and reservation-based native populations, um, I think that we can sometimes exaggerate where there is a, a rift or uh, potential uh, competition. Oftentimes, different sources of funding um, are not available for urban and reservation populations. And I think that there's really a spirit of cooperation that's underlying all of the desire to do economic development in Indian country, be it in urban areas or on reservations, which is essentially that we want to do what's best for our people. And during my tenure at the Nea Family Center, we were, um, a major project that we're very proud of is the Generations Project, which is a, an intergenerational uh, housing project, which is in Southeast Portland. And that specific project has definitely the support of many different reservation communities who understand the unique challenges that are facing urban Indian populations as a sort of invisible population of native people. A lot of folks wouldn't realize that Portland is the ninth largest urban Indian population in the United States, that there are more than 40,000 native people in this area. Area. And we face really unique challenges as an urban Indian population, primarily predicated on the fact that we're seen as invisible. Our poverty rates are three times higher, uh, particularly um, single mothers with children under five are approximately 80% living in poverty in this county. We have twice the rate of rejection for housing applications. We have twice the rate of infant mortality in the first year. And those problems aren't unique to Native people, but knowing that these issues take place here in Portland, we are also extremely overrepresented in the foster care system, and we have a, a, a lack of affordable housing, which is a crisis that affects everyone in the Portland region, but particularly is acute in the urban Native population. So NEA's project of building intergenerational housing in Southeast Portland takes a holistic approach to removing children from the foster care system who would otherwise be placed with non-Native families, housing them with elders who are highly at risk and susceptible to the effects of poverty and houselessness, and building an intentional community space that can be um, mutually supportive for all folks involved. So um, there, there are a lot of uh, solutions that exist in urban populations that aren't necessarily available in tribal situations and vice versa. Um, tribal populations definitely have a, the, the ability to uh, do intentionally focused housing, whereas in an urban population where we may be seeking uh, tax resources, you know, we would have a, a hang up in trying to build urban Indian focused housing. But um, I think the, the spirit of cooperation underlies that we, we, we seek to build these resources for our communities to really address the issues that we're facing. Thank you. And uh, in my experience uh, in natural resources, I've been on many different boards and I, I um, am always fascinated that there's 
uh, so few people from communities of colors that are represented on um, in the area of, of environmental protection. And you might see a few Native Americans, but not many other communities of color. And, and I'm curious, Sean or Kathleen, because of your wonderful background in the philanthropic world, if either of you have any thoughts on how we can better engage uh, communities of color. Well, thanks for that wonderful question, Paul. I think it's something that we need to address uh, simply because we want our nonprofit organizations to reflect the diversity of Oregonians and to be responsive organizations as Oregon continues to diversify and diversify more quickly than many other states. If we're really gonna be serving Oregon and the full Oregon, we need to have all of these facets of Oregonians on our boards and at the leadership level. There's no more organic way to empower an organization to uh, have a broad view of the communities that they're serving than by having the members of those communities serving at the leadership level. And certainly at Spirit Mountain Community Fund, that's something that we very openly encourage with all of our partners. Uh, and it's something that we seek to do too whenever we form um, our boards, even at the tribal level. We try to see, you know, do we have elders? Do we have younger people? We need to be developing leaders. Who are all the folks who need to be reflected as we're making decisions about what Oregon is going to need? And so I, I hope that's a conversation we're going to continue and we're going to encourage throughout uh, Oregon with our partners. If, if I may add, um, you know, I think a key issue in the environmental movement having been perceived as predominantly white is uh, that the stories of non-white communities have yet to be really elevated to the level of concern of those of the white community. And so you have a sort of white aesthetic environmentalism that exists which uplifts the concern over uh, an individual community over a sort of broader context of understanding the history that puts African American communities and Native American communities and Latino and Asian communities in this city at greater risk of exposure to airborne toxics. So um, when we think about how we're going to change the conversation from that white aesthetic environmentalism to a real multiracial movement for environmental justice, it's important for us to uplift the stories of individuals who've been historically marginalized to say, we're still here, we're not gone, these are our issues that we face, and we have the right and the ability to lead on campaigns to improve those situations. Excellent, thank you. If you're just tuning in on OPB, you're listening to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Paul Lemley, and I'm joined by Sean Fleek, Kathleen George, and Darrell Kalika, and we're talking about environmental justice in Native communities. Uh, Darrell, I'd like to uh, turn my attention to climate change, and, and I've I've been made to believe very strongly that climate change is the defining challenge of our lifetimes. Yet in Indian country, we can't seem to get the financial resources necessary to address the many challenges uh, in Indian country for our first foods and, uh, and the federal response uh, to the needs of Indian country for climate change are very limiting. And I'm, uh, asking if you can give us some of your thoughts on steps forward that, um, that we can take to address climate change with such limited uh, federal resources. Well, I think that's a great question. And in terms of the limited federal resources that are out there, I think it's also challenging because a lot of tribes and tribal communities, um, whether they're large tribal communities or small tribal communities, are all in competition for these limited resources, yet Native communities are often the first to feel the effects of climate change, um, particularly as we see in the state of Alaska. Um, you know, most of the tribes up there are heavily impacted by climate changing uh, temperatures in, in the ocean, um, permafrost is, you know, is melting. So I think all of these things are of concern, but also particularly looking at, you know, catastrophic weather events. I mean, a number of the tribal communities along the coast are having to be relocated. For example, the Quinault Nation is relocating the, village, the entire village of Tahola because of the effects of climate change and possible tsunami effects. So I think going forward, again, as Kathleen mentioned, it's forming those collaborative partnerships and being able to work together. I mean, it's something, climate change is something that affects all of us. And as if it's, you know, on the east side, we're dealing with catastrophic fires. Um, on the west side, we're dealing with floods. Even though we are a water-rich region, um, we have a lot of things, I think, that we need to work together um, in terms of communities, communities of color working together 
together. And for tribes, I think it's really about leveraging those partnerships with our neighbors. I think climate change um, has brought together the partnerships between tribes, particularly in their local neighbors. Um, for example, I'm from Central Oregon and you know the partnership between some of our neighboring communities was not always positive, but I think as a result of the need to work together on climate issues, on energy issues, on water issues, is forming these wonderful alliances and partnerships. So I think it's strengthening those, finding funding resources that we can leverage together um, to address this, this issue, I agree that Climate change is a, is a huge um, legacy, unfortunately, that our children are going to inherit and that we need to help strengthen them and give them some tools to deal with it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, anybody wanna follow up? Well, I just had one follow up thought, uh, Paul, about uh, you, you know, you're raising that issue of, of environmental justice and our need too to have an environmental community, an environmental movement um, that, that is diverse, that embraces all Oregonians. And I think, you know, one of the reasons we have to remember why that's so critically important is because uh, it is often uh, folks who are disproportionately affected by the degradation of our environment, whether that be polluted water and then polluted fish. It doesn't matter if you are a traditional fishing family who eats a great deal more fish than state regulators might assume you eat and therefore you're ingesting a lot more toxins. Doesn't matter if you're doing that because you are traditional native people or because you are a poor family and you catch whatever fish uh, you, know, you can catch to feed your family at the dinner table. And if that is bass and it contains a lot of mercury, then, then those folks are very vulnerable to the effects of pollution. And those communities are often not communities well empowered to engage with the powers that be, whether they be regulatory or the industry that benefits from this pollution, to change the circumstances that cause the pollution that affect their lives. And so I think that's why we do need uh, diverse and rich environmental partnerships, tribal, non-tribal, urban, rural, because uh, it is the most vulnerable that we have to remember. <laughs> We have to remember it's our obligation to protect um, everyone who is affected by this pollution. And I think it's through those rich partnerships that we will do that better. And then, you know, when that family that's uh, fishing for just survival and feeding their family and that native family of fisher people who eat fish every day, you know, if those fish are clean enough for them to eat safely, all Oregonians benefit. So. Um, I really do think that those complex partnerships are our are, are way forward. Excellent. I'm really glad you brought up the topic of toxic communication, uh, contamination. Uh, there are a lot of fish that swim in our rivers in this area, and I don't think anybody uh, would drink the water out of the Willamette or the Columbia River right now. But the fish don't have a choice. They have to swim in the river, and then we as Native people eat so many more fish than the general public. In fact, some of the studies that the tribes did uh, a couple of decades ago resulted in the state of Oregon now having the most protective water quality standard in the nation. How about a round of applause for Oregon? It's great to have a wonderful goal like that, but we definitely have major challenges ahead of us. We have, uh, for example, the Portland Harbor Superfund. Uh, and uh, I am very, very happy that we have tribal governments that have stepped forward to do the right thing and make sure that the uh, water gets cleaned up. Uh, does anybody on the panel have a thought on uh, the direction that uh, we're going with the Portland Harbor Superfund when it comes to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency or the city of Portland? I, I, would, I would offer that... Um, the situation that led to the creation of a Superfund, the existence of this extremely toxic bastion of water that is so crucial for the wildlife and for the populations that depend on the wildlife, that historical context of industrial pollution is the same treatment that many of our indigenous people receive. The land and the resources are treated as expendable the same way that indigenous people are. And so for us to course correct, and find a path forward, we first really have to value the existence of those things for what they are and how important and integral they are to one another's existence. To move ahead on the Superfund cleanup site and to find a way to improve what is a dastardly situation, 
We have to listen to those people who are most impacted, to sort of echo what you were just saying about how when we clean up the fish for the most impacted community, it makes the fish better for all communities. This is really the, the truth of how you solve pretty much every environmental injustice, is you look for the person who's most impacted by it, and you make their situation better. It's the, the concept of targeted universalism, that by finding the person who's most harmed, making sure that their voice is heard and their concern is addressed, the concerns of everyone else that may be tangential or not nearly as important or uh, directly felt will be felt, uh, will be addressed. And so it's really key in looking at how we address these uh, really thorny and intersectional environmental injustices that we uplift the perspectives of those who have been most harmed and find a way to solve their concerns first. That's excellent. You know, uh, environmental justice is a concept that um, was really invented for Indian country. But I'm always um, surprised how connected we are to other communities of color when it comes to environmental justice. And right in this area, uh, we had a flood uh, uh, many decades ago, the Vanport flood, and the African American community was devastated. They should never have been forced to live in the floodplain that way, but this terrible flood came along and it forced two countries to come together, United States and Canada, to quickly negotiate a water treaty that resulted in many dams being built in Canada and the United States that devastated an ecosystem, destroyed tribal villages. And every time we go upriver, we see these reservoirs behind dams and we think, oh, that's just a reservoir. Uh, but it's producing cheap and free energy. Well, it's not cheap and it's not free. Uh, tribal communities sacrifice more than probably any other community. And uh, um, it's hard to get people to understand that, yes, environmental justice is there, but we as a community of color are so connected to our other communities of color, and the more we can stick together, I think the better off we all will be. Is there anybody here that would like to pick up on the theme of uh, environmental justice and uh, our partnerships with other communities of color? So um, OPAL is working in partnership with the Coalition of Communities of Color and the Native American Youth and Family Center on an indigenous-led uh, environmental justice community organizing project to prioritize economic development activities within the Multnomah County region, which we see as most beneficial to the communities that are hit first and worst by climate change. And so partner to that table, you have organizations representing communities of color across the region. Um, the Latino Network, Vos Workers' Rights Center, the Portland African American Leadership Forum, uh, the uh, APANO, the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, NEA, Verde. These organizations came together and said, we're doing climate resilience. We're doing work that will prevent and mitigate and adapt to climate change. And there are resources that are flowing around and, you know, governments from the city all the way up to the, the federal level are asking, you know, what do we do to prevent climate change? And we as most impacted people come together and we say, here's what we're doing that we know will adapt to climate change. It also provides economic benefits to our people. It insulates our homes. It provides energy efficiency. It prevents floodplains and, and uh, the risk of fires from reaching our communities. So we've prioritized and we've said we want these policies and prior prioritized and we want decision makers to make these things a reality for us because again, when you target your prioritization of climate action where it is felt first and worst, uh, you will then mitigate climate for the, the entire community. Well, and I think I'd just like to touch again, Paul, I was so glad you raised the Portland Harbor cleanup because this is such a timely issue. You know, right now, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, tribes, and communities across Portland and across Oregon who have been affected by this uh, incredible level of contamination we have right here in the Willamette River running through downtown Portland. I really believe that for Oregon, the Portland Harbor cleanup is, is going to be one of those litmus tests, environmental litmus tests for our generation. You know, this really is our opportunity to come to terms with uh, the river that flows you know, right through downtown Portland and feeds the Willamette Valley and provides us all with such a tremendously rich lifestyle uh, is harmed, is very deeply, deeply sick. And our fisheries who travel through there, whether it's 
you know, onto the southern Willamette Valley or over to the Grand Ronde Reservation or just through this town where so many people harvest those fish to put on their own dinner tables. I think now is the time that we really have to dig deep as a community. We really have to push for the best cleanup we can possibly can so that we can have the greatest healing of our resources to support a rich and thriving Portland and Oregon. And so we're going to be hoping uh, for folks to stand up and insist that we must have an excellent, urgent Portland Harbor cleanup. Thank you. If you're just tuning in to OPB, you're listening to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Paul Lemley, and I'm joined by Sean Fleet, Kathleen George, and Darrell Kalika. And we're talking about environmental justice in Native communities. In just a moment, I'm going to ask for your recommendations on what to do moving forward. And the reason why is because uh, just this week, uh, the tribes and First Nations co-hosted a conference here in Portland called Future of Our Salmon, and we had a huge turnout at the conference. And uh, the focus was on uh, healthy rivers, healthy floodplains, but uh, we were also focusing on a call to action. And we had uh, Senator Merkley come out and uh, EPA Reg Region 10 Administrator Dennis McLaren and others give very specific recommendations on how to um, take action to help. And I'm curious as to if you have any uh, thoughts or recommendations on steps forward uh, under the theme of a call to action. Sure, thanks Paul. So one of the things I think that I've been really been working with the, the tribes at Affiliated Tribes Northwest Indians on is developing one, uh, our climate policy platform, but also our energy policy platform. And now we're starting to move into water. So these three things are really connected in terms of one, making sure our tribal leadership knows and can speak intelligently about these issues. But the other piece is, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, relationship that the tribes, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, have not just here in the uh, lower 48, but also in Alaska, as well as with our brothers and sisters, First Nations in, in Vancouver. So one of the things that we're really working on is developing uh, a working relationship, a collaborative relationship amongst tribes and First Nations on, on energy. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the reservoirs on the uh, Federal Columbia River hydro system, tribes pay some of the highest um, energy rates in the Northwest. Although it's cheap electricity by market standards, um, tribes pay heavily for it. And so I think in terms of going forward, we're really looking at opportunities for developing tribal capacity in some of these areas that have not been traditionally um, had a, a workforce by tribal people. Uh, energy is one of those. Um, we have a lot of people who have expertise in natural resources, but not a lot on the industrial and technical side. So that's one of the things we're really working for is, is those actions of being active participants instead of passive participants in policy. I think the other piece is having a seat at the table. I mean, again, tribes have not traditionally had a seat at the table when it comes to some of these complex industrial issues like energy. And so that's, again, one of those things that we're really pushing for is to, to have our place and have our voices heard. So uh, w folks come to me and to our organization fairly often to ask how to support the environmental justice movement, um, particularly people who find out about environmental justice predating the environmentalist movement, really being rooted in the long struggle against colonization, indigenous uh, suffrage for uh, land rights is really the original um, of this continent environmental justice struggle. And sometimes people can feel uh, as though environmental justice, the concerns of communities of color and of low income are sort of other, and they wanna be an ally. And my response is always to say that we don't need allies anymore. We need accomplices. We need people who are willing to put their skin in the game. And so when you hear about a struggle of another community, if you think of that community as other to you and as unrelated to you, then you won't put your own skin in the game. You won't commit your own resources. You won't do as my uncle did and take off a, work of, uh, a week of work so that you can go to the Standing Rock Reservation and see for yourself what's happening there. When you see all of us as related, as all of our concerns as interdependent, you become an accomplice and you're willing to commit your time and your energy and your resources to making sure that the concerns of our most impacted communities are uplifted and upheld. So it means 
doing what you can for your fellows. It means signal boosting the voices that are not usually heard. It means retweeting the people with not very many followers. It means organizing. It means getting organized. It means knowing when your place is to stand back and let amazing indigenous women and leaders step forward. It means knowing when to step back and letting people who have been traditionally marginalized take the fore. But it is a movement for all of us. It is definitely all of our work to make sure that this planet remains for the next seven generations and beyond. And in order to do that, every one of us has a statement. Well, and I'd like to raise uh, a couple of issues that I think are, are, again, very timely and show how interconnected uh, our fates are and how much is at stake when we bother to look and see how healthy our environment actually is. Because in our day-to-day -day life, we're all busy going to work and going to school and taking care of our families, and we're not thinking about how much air pollution may be deposited from a local business until somebody, so one day somebody does take a look and we haven't tested uh, the drinking fountains in our schools, so we don't know there's any reason to be concerned until somebody does take a look, and then we're terribly concerned. And, and we're not concerned about the toxics in our fish until some tribe manages to get the funding they need to test those fish for toxics, and they take a look, and we find out that the level of toxins in that fish are actually very worrisome for people who eat a lot of fish. So I think it's uh, one of the things that we can do is support our state agencies, our federal agencies, our local agencies, and our tribes when they take a look. And I can tell you it's very hard for you know, small rural tribes or small environmental organizations to get the funding to do this kind of work. And there are those who don't necessarily want it done. Right? There, there are folks who've benefited from their ability to easily pollute either through the air or through the water. And so one of the things we can do is recognize that if we aren't taking a look, then we don't really know what those potential problems are. And we can support the communities that are taking a look. Um, several years ago, uh, I, before I went into the field of philanthropy, I spent most of my career doing environmental work for tribes and, and worked on the project, was fortunate to work on the project, uh, Paul, you mentioned, where Oregon tribes and others worked together to change Oregon water quality standards to protect the health of people who eat a lot of fish. I can tell you that was a long and lonely seven-year battle with state and federal agencies. And, and one of the first arguments that came back at the tribes when they said, wait, hold on, the, the level of toxins we're finding in our fish suggests that our people may have health impacts. One of the first responses that came from, from those who currently benefit from being able to, to put pollutants in our rivers was, well, there aren't that many tribal members. There really aren't that many. So to have to change regulation to protect that many people is really asking a lot. Well, I think it's asking something tremendously important. And I know for a fact it's not only tribal members who eat a lot of fish. So I think uh, what we can do is we can look. And we can support one another in uh, monitoring our environment. And we can support uh, the many people who rely on a healthy environment, our children, our fish-eating families, our people who recreate in our rivers. And I think that's, that's where those partnerships will help all Oregonians inherit a healthier future. Excellent. And I'm going to answer my own question, the call to action. And it comes from the conference that we had this week, the Future of Our Salmon Conference. And uh, we were lacking in involvement of the younger generation. In fact, one of our panelists asked, um, are there any young people here? And asked to raise a hand, and I was shocked at how many older people raised their hand. <laughs> so we ended up defining young as 45 and younger. <laughs> But uh, we are not doing a good enough job at reaching out to the next generation. And we saw that uh, very clearly at our conference. And the world is changing in the way we communicate with each other as well. It's, it's no longer good enough to send an email out or create a website. Um, we communicate in modern ways. And we need to listen to the younger people just as much as we do our elders. In fact, I'm so glad to see that the Native American Youth Association has a table here with youth from the schools. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. 
So as a recommendation uh, from the conference was to start uh, uh, with the younger folks and we've uh, established a, a youth core of, of sorts to address um, environmental issues. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, before we uh, go to questions to the audience, are there any final thoughts from the panelists? Recommendations? I guess I would just like to thank you, Paul, and everybody here for bringing this issue before Portland and Oregon. We see um, folks from all around the country going to find out what's happening uh, with the Standing Rock Sioux and supporting that organization. And I hope that this is, you know, what economists would call a tipping point. This is a critical point at which we realize that the destiny of the Standing Rock Sioux is not so separated from the destiny of the people who rely on the Willamette River and that taking care of our rivers is taking care of our people. And so uh, we, have, we don't have a, a pipeline going under our river, but we have a great deal going into our river. And uh, we, our futures all rely on our rivers. So I think we should be a part of this tipping point and we should band together to realize that our future is intertwined with the health of our rivers. Well, let's now go to the audience for some questions. If you've, been, if you've written a question on an index card, hold it high for staff to collect. I'll read at least one index card question first. We invite City Club members to ask their questions at the microphone. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. Greg McPherson, City Club member. Uh, there, there are a couple of dams along the Klamath River that have been removed because they're older and not as productive of hydroelectric power. Uh, is there a prospect for dam removal along the main stem of the Columbia? Do you want me to answer that? Oh, yes, my last day at Critvik. I can answer however I want. <laughs> it's your last day at Critvik, right? <laughs> Well, uh, the answer is yes, and the question is a matter of time. Uh, each dam has different purposes, there are different phases of their, um, their lifespan, uh, and it also depends on who owns the dam and how willing they are to have the dam removed. Uh, one of my experiences is that if you can get the dam owner to um, agree the dam needs to be removed, then it makes it a lot easier. And oftentimes, uh, the, the age of a dam, the ability to get it, for example, relicensed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is a big deal. If it's going to be more expensive to bring the dam up to code than it is to take it out, then that often helps in the decision. If uh, you have federally owned dams like we do with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the dam owners are the federal government, and so it's a much different strategy. And so the likelihood of it happening anytime soon is probably not there. But eventually, these dams will get old. They will retire themselves. Uh, we see one of the oldest dams in the basin, the Wanapum Dam, for example, I believe it was last year or the year before, actually developed quite a few cracks in it, and there was some, um, quite a bit of worry about whether or not it would even fail. But the answer is yes, it's a matter of time, though. My name is Sharon Joy. I've been a member since 97. Um, are you sure you have to research anything much to learn that fireworks kind of pollutes the water and the air and so forth, that we're still celebrating war and don't think about it? I have more concern about the intelligence of the basics. Um, and then another thing, they shoo the seals away from Bonneville Dam with explosives, which of course is going to hurt the other fish too, uh, when you could fish so much better and, and give those um, seals to you for a celebration. Uh, my question is, do we have any hope for just common sense? Uh, 
I, I actually well, um, common sense. Yes, please, Sean. Ask so, <laughs> no. I while while I, I appreciate the sentiment, I actually think that uh, the way that we treat the planet right now is representative of three essential ongoing crises. One of those crises is the the crisis of militarism and imperialism. That the crisis of empire is real, and that it leads to us treating this planet and its resources as expendable, just as readily as the crisis in our economy and the crisis in our environment. And so we should really take a serious look at the things that happen in our culture that put us in a situation where we think that it's okay to explode stuff. You know, the um, sea lion issue at uh, Bonneville Dam is not one of creation by the tribes. Uh, we didn't build the dam, and, uh, <laughs> but we have to deal with uh, sea lions that have found an easy way to kill a lot of fish and they are taking a tremendous amount of the fish. They've figured it out coast-wide. Uh, up north in the Puget Sound area, the sea lions almost completely wiped out a whole salmon run. So it is a serious problem. We are looking for solutions, uh, but as long as the dam is there, we're gonna have a problem with uh, predators attacking our salmon. So, yes, next question. Thanks, Courtney Nelson, City Club member. Um, Darrell, I think you touched on that you're expecting tribes to enter into or look more into renewable energy, and I just was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more and what you've seen. So Indian country, um, tribes own about 10% of the nation's energy resource assets, yet we develop them about 2% of the time. And in terms of that, you look at particularly tribes throughout just even the West, and how many tribes in the Southwest have huge tracts of land that are open to development of solar resources. Um, tribes in the Northwest have access to water, and one of the you know, areas that we're looking at or some of the tribes are looking at is pump storage. How do you create batteries to save energy? Um, looking at wind in particular. I know it's not always the most attractive. I know there's a lot of folks, young people particularly, as you mentioned, the youth, trying to figure out how do you make these um, renewable projects more aesthetically pleasing for our communities? I think that there's a, a need and desire there by tribal communities to develop these renewable resources. And one of those is, is kind of a controversial one, which is, is dams. You know, we do have some tribes in the Northwest that do own their own dams. So, but I think if tribes had had the ability to be consulted during the time that the dams were put into place, things might look a little bit different, quite a bit different. Um, so I think that there are a number of things. Uh, one project I did want to mention, which is a, really a great project because it's very balanced, it has multiple purposes, multiple benefits, is uh, the Tulalip tribe owns this, what's called the Qualco Energy Project, which is an anaerobic digester. And it's, it's great, they really started the project because they wanted to clean up the watershed and the water. But now it's got also, they're selling power to Snohomish PUD. So again, I think that there's just these areas and opportunities for tribes to get engaged, but as the capacity is building and you're getting more and more tribal people that are getting into this area, um, I think we're starting to see a growth in that sector. Okay, let's, um, let's turn to a question uh, on one of these cards. And because I called out the need to include our native youth, this is a, on the top it says a native youth question. So. <laughs> says, uh, I would like to know if you know about the Jordan Cove pipeline going through the Klamath tribe's land. And uh, Darrell, this is, might be, I don't know if you know specifically about this pipeline, but um, energy moves throughout the Northwest in different ways. Uh, we have more pipelines actually than people are aware of that go throughout the whole Northwest. And can you shed some light on uh, this kind of a question, how we might be able to address issues like this? Well, I think part of the, the critical piece, and as I said, tribes being at the table, and part of it is siting. You're absolutely correct that there are pipelines here in the Pacific Northwest. And that's one of the things we're looking at is, you know, the development of energy corridors. When we say development of energy corridors, a lot of people think, oh, we're just talking about transmission lines. Um, that's not exactly it, because it also includes the natural gas and as well as, you know, 
the rail and transport of um, coal and fossil fuels through the Columbia River Basin. So we have a lot of energy moving through the Pacific Northwest that is quote unquote dirty energy as well as um, clean energy. I think looking um, into the future, natural gas is really going to play a critical role. We all like to have a cheap energy bill and where does that cheap energy come from right now is natural gas. And so that's going to you know have a tipping effect at some point in the Pacific Northwest because we, you know, most of the resources that we have has been hydro. Um, there's an anticipation by 2028 that um, natural gas will be the cheapest uh, energy on the block. So what does that do to organizations like Bonneville Power Administration? Does that, I mean, is Bonneville going to stay in, in business? Can they compete with the natural gas markets? So again, um, I can't specifically uh, address the, the issue on the Klamath, but yes, um, pipelines and, and natural gas are going to be a critical issue for tribes and all of us in the Northwest. Thank you. Let's uh, take a question from the microphone. Um, yeah, my name is Jacqueline Keeler and I am a City Club member. Um, I'm also a journalist, and I just got back from Standing Rock, and my, my dad's tribe, the Yankton Sioux tribe, is suing the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, many of the sites there are from Ari Hunktamon sites that were dug up over Labor Day weekend burial sites. Um, my question has to do with sovereignty, um, the issue of uh, conflicting uses of sovereignty. Um, in 2013, I worked on a documentary about the Bakken, about Fort Berthold's development of its oil resources, and their chairman, Tex Hall, had a famous saying, um, sovereignty by the barrel. And um, you know, I'm looking at the conflicts between sovereignty by the barrel versus you know, water is life, protecting tribal um, lands and people. Um, sovereignty. And I also see similar conflicts here in the Pacific Northwest with uh, the Crow Nation developing its coal resources, which are being brought in coal trains along the Columbia River, endangering first foods of tribes there. Um, could you speak to that a bit? One of the uh, biggest challenges we're going to have are fossil fuels being transported through the Columbia River Gorge. The number of coal trains uh, is alarming, as well as oil trains. Um, there are places along the Columbia River now, you can walk out there and see coal along the tracks. It's falling off of the train. So there's already an environmental catastrophe that has occurred that is not being recognized or even being responded to by the coal companies or the railroads. So we have an, a disaster already without even an accident. Uh, we have one of the biggest um, oil train transfer stations being proposed, I think in the Northern Hemisphere, just across the river in Vancouver. Uh, if that proposal goes through, we're gonna have at least 10 times uh, more trains in the Columbia River Gorge, and we already saw one accident. So the question isn't if there's going to be an accident in the future, it's when and how many, and what is our ability to respond to all these accidents, not only from an environmental standpoint, but also from human life. Uh, so tribes have stepped forward on this topic more than I have seen in decades. Uh, putting the tribes' treaties on the line is a very scary prospect. We saw the tribes do that in the 60s and 70s when it came to the fishing rights. Uh, we fought that all the way to the Supreme Court and were victorious. But doing so is very scary and it's very dangerous. The makeup of the Supreme Court is not that great. And uh, uh, so, but the tribes seem to be willing to do that when it comes to combating uh, oil and coal. So, so sovereignty is an expression, it is to be exercised. Uh, it's not a gift, it has to be used. Emmy, want to add to that? I could follow up. You made reference to um, different tribes expressing their sovereignty through through sometimes um, very controversial actions of their own, whether those are, are business enterprises or, or other actions. And, and to those who may not be familiar with the concept in this idea of tribal sovereignty is that inherently as uh, the, the modern government of their own ancient peoples, our tribal governments have the right to decide their own fate. They have the right to choose their own future, use their resources in the ways that they see fit. And uh, just like our different states see some of these issues extremely differently, uh, sometimes people are surprised to find that some of our tribes see these issues very, very differently. And where they hear some tribes um, 
speaking against certain types of economic development that might damage the environment, other tribes might be taking advantage of that economic development. And I think one of the things that, that is almost always in play when that occurs is what uh, options does that tribe perceive that they have to support their people. You know, typically our Indian reservations are rurally isolated and very often tribal governments have few options to develop sustainable economies. Now this work continues and it's growing and becoming more creative all the time and people like Durrell and others are helping tribes with new opportunities, but the fact remains that many of our tribes are very rurally isolated and developing an economy is incredibly difficult. So some tribes do make these decisions that at times may even be in conflict with the interests of other tribes. That's one of the difficulties of the concept of sovereignty is that tribe gets to make that decision even though the state of Oregon and the state of Idaho may not see things the same way. Uh, they, each, they each do get to make their own policy decisions and to pursue them and that can be very difficult. That was an excellent question, thank you. Do we have time for another question or? Unfortunately, we are out of broadcast time but we can follow up afterwards, I'm sure. I want to uh, please join me in thanking our very thoughtful panel today. <laughs> Greatly appreciate you being here today and as an energy nerd, I really liked the conversation. Uh, uh, I'm Courtney Nelson, president of City Club. Please join me again in thanking our guests as well as thanking Colin Jones and Maggie Talmadge of the Friday Forum Committee for putting together today's program. We're adjourned.